On April 8, 2013, an extraordinary presentation was given at the San Diego Air and Space Museum by a relatively unknown national treasure. That presentation follows this introduction to the epic career adventures of Mr. Norman Howard Casson. This is not a technical detailed video about engineering. Rather, it is intended to provide somewhat of a balance to the many books and documentaries that discuss personal experiences and issues faced by the Apollo astronauts. This presentation gingerly and ever so delicately recognizes that while the astronauts flew, landed, and returned safely to Earth, they did not sprout wings and fly to the moon. Rather, they did so only by the machines and equipment designed, manufactured, assembled, checked out, and certified through a final mission dress rehearsal by engineers and technical forces that supported the engineering effort to transport the astronauts in this bold project of historic proportions. What you are about to see is a rare glimpse into the epic life of one of Apollo's most senior engineering heroes. Norman Howard Casson, Executive Engineering Manager, NASA Apollo Spacecraft Checkout Group, April 8, 2013. Norman Howard Casson is a veteran aerospace engineer with active service that goes back nearly 60 years, starting with his military involvement with combat and cargo aircraft during the Korean War in the United States Air Force. He spent nearly his entire career in the Air Force with the famous and still widely praised Heavy Bomber Strike Force known as the Strategic Air Command that was under the command of the immortalized General Curtis Emerson LeMay of World War II and Cold War fame. During his military career, Mr. Casson was directly involved with several combat and cargo aircraft, including heavy bombers such as the B-29, B-50, B-36 and the B-52, as well as in-flight air refueling tankers, such as the KC-97 and the KC-135, and cargo aircraft such as the C-124 Globemaster. During the Cold War, the B-52 heavy bomber aircraft were continuously circling the globe in a combat readiness posture, being refueled in flight by the KC-135 air refueling tankers all the while awaiting a coded signal from the President of the United States to proceed and strike their targets with thermonuclear warheads, all of this taking place as a deterrent against open acts of aggressive thermonuclear hostility from the Soviet Union. Mr. Casson was an active member in the Combat Readiness Technical Force of the Strategic Air Command, simply referred to as SAC. He was a member of an elite technical Tiger team which was a mobile squad of six men per airbase, each having a thorough engineering knowledge and understanding of the specific high-tech systems on each combat aircraft system. In the event that the ground maintenance personnel could not solve a technical problem, the elite technical Tiger team would be dispatched under emergency escort to the ailing aircraft where they would troubleshoot with lightning speed and then direct the ground maintenance personnel in whatever repairs, adjustments, or tweaking was necessary in order to get that B-52 down the runway and in the air within a predetermined time window to rendezvous with other bombers and refuelers. During the late 1950s and early 1960s, the United States decided to add medium and long-range missiles to its arsenal of deterrent weapons. This coincided with the time when the Air Force flight surgeons determined that resulting from the resurfacing of a past injury, Mr. Casson should be completely removed from flying status. This decision did not sit well with Mr. Casson, and thus prompted him to decide against re-enlisting for another military tour of duty in the Air Force. So after 10 years and one month of active military service, Mr. Casson left the Air Force active duty 
but stayed with the Cold War and the Air Force as a civilian. This time, instead of involving heavy B-52 bombers and KC-135 air refuelers as a deterrent against hostilities from the Soviet Union, Mr. Casson became involved with the most high-tech, lethal, deadliest weapon system in existence at the time, the Titan I Intercontinental Ballistic Missile, a weapon that was capable of striking within only a short distance from its predetermined target with thermonuclear warheads from a distance of over 6,000 miles away. Within a few short years, this system was upgraded to the much improved and even more deadly Titan II ICBM. As was the case when he was in the Air Force, Mr. Casson was in a key managerial position on these weapon systems. As an engineering launch test conductor for a single such missile, an underground silo on the Titan I program, headquartered at Larson Air Force Base, located near Moses Lake, Washington, and even in a higher managerial position on the Titan II as the chief test conductor over several such missiles in their silos. And after the recycling to replace defective seals, he was totally responsible for the engineering launch countdown checkout of all 18 Titan II ICBMs headquartered in the areas around Davis Montem Air Force Base in Tucson, Arizona. During those times working with the Air Force, both as a military and civilian SAC warrior, Mr. Casson honed his technical fault isolation skills to an even sharper edge and gained a reputation for having an exceptional computer-like memory, as well as a faultless detailed understanding of the flow and properties within those combat aircraft of electricity, fluids, air, energy, cryogenics, etc., all of which gave Mr. Casson the reputation of having a weird and almost uncanny ability to perform fault isolation troubleshooting on those high-tech weapon systems with seemingly lightning speed and with pinpoint accuracy. But Norm Casson is known mainly for his contributions to the nation's lunar landing program, the Apollo Project, under the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, who trusted Mr. Casson with the awesome responsibility to thoroughly test and check out every NASA manned spacecraft and take it through a dress rehearsal of its mission with the actual NASA astronaut crew members on board the spacecraft operating the controls all of which was monitored and responded to from the control rooms, much like the ones at the Cape and at Houston. This final assembly and testing was done in the brand new massive Building 290, which was specifically designed for this operation with an exceptional towering truss height. A recent international survey indicated that most of the world population thinks that the Apollo spacecraft was born in either Cape Kennedy Florida, or at the Space Center in Houston, Texas. Not true for either. Every NASA Apollo spacecraft, manned or unmanned, was conceived, designed, fabricated, manufactured, and assembled, and then taken through its entire test, checkout, and missions dress rehearsal right here in Southern California, more specifically in Downey, just north of here, on Lakewood Boulevard, by NASA's prime contractor, North American Aviation, later North American Rockwell, at the massive Space Division complex that was taken over by NASA especially for Apollo. It consisted of several buildings and several hundred acres of land. This was a city within a city. There was a complete engineering test team assigned to each of the four very tall checkout stations in Building 290 where four NASA Apollo spacecraft were checked out simultaneously. Each engineering test team consisted of system engineers, quality control engineers, safety engineers, test conductor engineers, test technicians, test pilots, test procedure engineers, automatic data processing engineers for the control rooms, as well as engineering experts who were certified to handle supercooled cryogenics 
and extremely toxic fuels and oxidizers. The Apollo Spacecraft Checkout Organization, led by Mr. Casson, had four control and information centers, one for each team, with real-time status plotters and supervision for each test team. This is also where each team, including the NASA astronauts, held their pre-test briefings and post-test review meetings. The actual NASA Apollo astronauts who were assigned to each spacecraft were required by NASA to be pre-certified for their flight missions into space only after several months of training at the Downey Building 290 test facility by operating the onboard spacecraft controls during each test and checkout phase. Each of the aforementioned test teams was managed by a top-level engineering manager called the Senior Test Project Engineering Manager, all four of which reported directly to Mr. Casson. This entire engineering test team that was just outlined, including each Senior Test Project Engineering Manager, all of the engineers, test conductors, technicians, clerical people, procedure writers, and all the rest, was organized into one huge organization for the engineering test and checkout and dress rehearsal of each of those manned NASA spacecraft. This huge engineering organization was known throughout the world of Apollo as Apollo Spacecraft Checkout, and Norman Howard Casson was the top executive responsible for this entire massive organization. NASA headquarters and North American Aviation trusted the awesome total top management responsibility which included the engineering, total administration and budget for this massive organization to this one man, Norman Howard Kessel. The spacecraft checkout group functioned like a well-organized unit in a factory-like manner to get all of those NASA Apollo spacecraft certified to be in a posture acceptable for their NASA missions into the deep void of space. The spacecraft checkout team maintained program schedule dictates. They never had any major injuries to personnel during testing. They were praised by NASA at the Cape for shipping spacecraft that were indeed ready to launch. The astronauts were ready for their flights because they had already been through much of the mission on the ground at the space checkout facility in Downey, California. NASA expressed their appreciation for a job well done to Mr. Casson, personally as well as in official correspondence. During his illustrious aerospace career of nearly six decades, he received numerous awards, citations, plaques, special honors, and letters of favorable communication, far too numerous to mention at this setting, but in mentioning a few, a life-size color photograph of him standing with three NASA astronauts was on display at the Smithsonian Institute for 12 years before it was taken down around 30 years ago. He was nominated three times for Outstanding Young Man in America, and as seen here when astronaut Dave Scott saluted Norm from the moon during Apollo 15 with his note of warm personal regards. Norm became one of only a few engineers to be presented with the Gold Titan Award for Titan I, and later, on the Titan II, he became one of only seven engineers throughout the entire United States to have been presented with two Gold Titan Awards. The Chuck Schultz comic character, Little Dog Snoopy, was the official mascot of the entire NASA Apollo project. For Norm's above and beyond contributions to the Apollo project, Mr. Casson was also awarded the most coveted Silver Snoopy Award by the NASA Apollo astronauts. He also won several certificates, awards, and special recognitions for his ability to effectively organize large groups of people, as well as for the demonstration of his exceptional ability to be an effective executive manager. On August 26, 2011, during the book signing of Falling to Earth, that was co-authored by Apollo 15 astronaut Alfred Warden and internationally known veteran aerospace writer Francis French, who incidentally was director of education for this museum, 
Mr. Castle was also invited to attend a VIP gathering that evening with other friends and associates of the Apollo 15 astronaut after his book signing. On January 27, 2010, Norm was honored with a VIP red carpet return to Downey visit to the NASA Space Division facility in Downey. On November 17, 2011, Norm had the distinct honor to be included along with the astronauts Rusty Schweikhardt and Jim McDivitt, seen here with Norm and his niece, Rosalind Casson, at the Legends of Flight Banquet, which was an international gathering of who's who in aerospace, all of which was presented by this museum with the style and elegance of Academy Awards royalty, with a brightly illuminated red carpet for the honored aerospace guests, including Mr. Norman Howard Kessel, to wave and smile as they strolled the length of the carpet to the museum's entrance. The NASA Apollo Spacecraft Checkout Group, under Mr. Norman Howard Kessel, did their part to not only meet but to actually beat the goals that were set forth by President John F. Kennedy at Rice University when he exhorted our country to commit itself to the goal before the end of the decade of the 1960s to land a man on the moon and return him safely to Earth. The San Diego Air and Space Museum is ever so pleased to have someone here with us today whose efforts were a major contribution towards the success of meeting that goal and commitment of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to Earth. Ladies and gentlemen and children of all ages, I present to you Mr. Norman Howard Kessel. Apollo uh, was something, when I heard, first heard about Apollo, I thought they, somebody's crazy. Uh, you know what a headhunters are? And some of you do. Uh, uh, the headhunters approached me uh, for Apollo. I was up at Denver, Colorado uh, on the Titan II update. And I did not want to go to Denver. I've got nothing against Colorado, don't get me wrong. It's just that I can't breathe up there. I mean, I was an asthmatic kid, for crying out loud. And if you have asthma, you know you're at that elevation. And you're trying to breathe at night. It seems like something, somebody is trying to steal your breath. And I'm there trying to work the missiles and so on, and I can hardly breathe. So, uh, and I made it clear to Martin, who was with Martin at that time, that I was not happy. And uh, they knew I was thinking about leaving. And uh, so the uh, headhunters, these are uh, the people who were commissioned by another company to go and hire you away from some other company. Now, you're not supposed to do that. That's not a good thing, but they do it anyhow. And the ones who lose somebody complains. And, 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 but in, in another instance, they'll be doing the same thing. So this, these headhunters find me, and they tell me that the, there's a company that's, that has won an award to go to the moon. I stopped talking to them. Are you kidding? Going to the moon, you know, I mean, the, that moon has been up there for all this time, and, and it's like my, mother, like my mother-in-law, Ida's mother, told me, yeah, you're not going to the moon. God never intended for you to go to the moon. <laughs> I have to tell you this, when we went, she said, well, I guess you met, you went, but God, God intended you to go there for all. <laughs> she, so anyhow, uh, uh, I did not believe, there was no way in the world I was going to believe that. And he said, what? And I started to walk off. He opened this briefcase and started showing me paperwork, and I became interested only from the standpoint of, this is a job that will get me out of Colorado. <laughs> again, again, nothing against Colorado. It's a beautiful state. I just couldn't breathe up there. So, uh, uh, so I, I thought about it, and uh, I said, okay, well, what do I have to do? He said, he said, you don't have to do anything. I said, but get a physical examination. I, I said, well, there's going to be an interview. He says, yeah, but it's all set all the way through. I earned my reputation before Apollo. I had the re I had the reputation. I earned it uh, on the ballistics missiles. And uh, if it sounds like I'm uh, bragging, uh, it, 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 you just you'll need to know that. Otherwise, you won't know how I advance. Understand how I advance so quickly in the aerospace. Uh, I, I I had this ability. Now my mother says that uh, it was a gift. And uh, my aunts and uncles say that also, but I'll tell you that story. Now, uh, 
I listened to Katrina, and as I was listening to her read all of that, my mind went back to the time when I was three years old. And at that time, I didn't want to live. Uh, 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 there, there is a, an executive minister who's the uh, uh, executive minister over all the uh, American Baptist churches of the uh, uh, Los Angeles and Pacific Southwest and Hawaii. And uh, I found him uh, to be a very credible person in, in what I would listen to. And uh, he told me about the, about the uh, laughter of God. And he, 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 he mentioned something about that. And as, 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 I, as I listened to Katrina, that's what I thought about. Sam's got, he, uh, Dr. Chen has got a pretty good idea because the way I did not want to live, thought I was going to die, and was pronounced dead by what? And, uh, and here I am. And I, I just think somehow oh God's up there laughing at me, saying, "See, I'm the one that's in charge. I'm going to call these numbers, not you." So uh, I, I went as Katrina was going through that. I thought about that. I, my mother and father and my uncles and aunts uh, said that, that they've never seen a person who did not want to be born. My my <laughs> father was called in to hold my mother's arms. Uh, the midwife was panicking. And uh, there was, I guess there was no way in the world that I wanted to be born. And I finally was, and I didn't talk, wouldn't talk. The only thing I did was cry, constantly, constantly crying for about three years. And, and uh, so, so, uh, so, so finally, I guess my parents, somebody got wise. Dad took me to the doctor. The doctor says, he's got the old man's asthma. It's my grandfather. He says, he's got the old man's asthma. So I suffered with deadly asthma attacks. And you're probably saying, okay, why don't you take the thing and put it in your nose and breathe? There was no medicine at that time. You guys have got medicine. We didn't have medicine. My mother, my grandmother, would make the, uh, uh, mint, go, go around the com community with a lantern and wake the men up and have them go out into the forest to get a certain bark and bring that back to her so she could boil it. Uh, for a, a, a tea to settle me down and, and stop me from having an asthma attack. And sometimes they didn't bring the right uh, uh, bark back and she would complain and send them back out there. And uh, they would bring that bark and, and, and most of the time that would settle things down. And uh, uh, this is an old uh, recipe. My grandmother was a Cherokee Indian. This was an old recipe. She used to sing those funny songs to, to me. She had. Uh, She's a little tiny woman. She had hair that went all the way down uh, to her thigh, to her uh, calf. And uh, when she bent down, that hair was all over the floor. And I'd run and pick it up and say, "I got it, Grandma. I got it. I got it." Hair everywhere. So, so, so uh, this one night, she sent them out. I had this bad asthma attack. It was late at night, and uh, she sent them out to get the bark, and she, they brought it back, and it didn't work. It just that didn't work, and uh, uh, and I was not really uh, uh, helping things because uh, I was hurting. I'd been hurting all my life. Uh, uh, all the other kids could go out and play. I couldn't go out and play. The damp air gave me asthma. The dust gave me asthma. My dog gave me asthma. The cat gave me asthma. The wind gave me asthma. The rain gave me, gave me asthma. And it, it, it just seemed like life just wasn't worth it for me. And uh, I just made a decision that I've had it. I just can't put up with this any longer. So I'm having this asthma attack. There's Dr. William Henry, the high school's making a here the other day. He's saying, breathe, boy, breathe, boy. And he's yelling at me, breathe, boy. And then these ladies come up, my aunt. Have you ever heard of a hot mustard bath? Raise your hand if you have. But well, then you know what I'm talking about. Those things are heavy. Think about a three-year-old kid. They put, I can't breathe. I can't lift my chest up. And they put this hot mustard pack on my chest. And that was it. I decided, I've had it. I'm going to stop breathing. I, it, it was a conscious decision that, that this was a curse, that, that, that my life just isn't worth anything. I'm going to stop. And there's Dr. Henry saying, breathe for it, breathe for it. He did. He kept saying that until he finally pronounced me dead. He did. I was pronounced dead. And... Uh, uh, I'm not going to say that I was trailing off into any clouds and any bright lights or anything like that. Uh, uh, the, the, 
there, there might have been some strange things, but uh, my scientific mind is still exploring that. And, but uh, anyhow, uh, my mother had been working. And she comes, and I hear her come in, and I hear her say, my baby, my baby. My mother tells the story after that. My mother said, Dr. Henry said, keep talking, Nancy, keep talking. He's coming back, keep talking. So she kept talking. And, and finally, I was, I, I was conscious that I was lying there on that, on that bed, and I had no pain. I had, did not have that, no breathing problems. I just felt great. I've never felt any better in my life. I am a man of science. I'm telling you, that's the truth. I'm not trying to explain what happened to you. I just explain facts. That's what I do. And that's, 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 that's what it was. I just, I just felt great. Now, now, my mother and my father and my aunts and uncles say I immediately started talking. Now, I don't recall that, but that's what they're saying. They're saying that I started talking and, uh, 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 and started showing this memory. In fact, uh, uh, at church, they gave me uh, a prize for the one who could remember the most books of the Bible. And they had two prizes, one for the New and one for the Old Testament. I took both prizes, just, just, just like that. Uh, uh, I, I had that memory. Uh, sometimes uh, in her earlier days, it would uh, concern Ida when she would ask if I could remember something. I could actually go back and remember that for her. But there's a problem that she would tell you. The problem is I live it when I go back there. That's not good on some incidents. That's, that's not good at all. Uh, and I had that kind of memory on up until the, uh, uh, started losing it around 60, 66 years old, I think. Uh, became less and less and less. Uh, but I, I still have that ability to analyze. And uh, <laughs> that's one of the things that helped me get through uh, the aerospace. Uh, NASA, uh, uh, the Department of Defense has a dossier on me, must be very thick. They know, every, they know who I am, what I've done, my, uh, where I'm going to the school, what the, my, my, who, who I know, the whole bit. And it's, uh, it's been, uh, been updated. Uh, 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 I remember, and the reason I'm mentioning this is because during Apollo, uh, some of the high rating dignitaries would come through and they would want somebody to go escort them. You know, we had all kinds of escorts, but they would claim they want somebody who really knows everything and said, that's you, they come and get me. So I would escort them uh, uh, around the complex and, uh, 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 and, and, and try to be genial about it. And uh, my concern is that they'd be hurt. Many of them would take their hard hats off and they would go close to that uh, to, to the metal structure, and I was afraid they'd get hit in the head and sue us for it. Uh, but, but one in particular, uh, uh, and, and, and I'm going through this to let you know, again, I've learned, I've, I've meddled, meddled. Uh, I've I met this tall gentleman, I'd seen him before, he and I had talked before, and uh, it was Dr. Warner Von Braun. And uh, 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 I'm not going to lie to you. I did not have a good feeling about Dr. Warner Von Braun. Uh, uh, and and he, he sensed that I did not. Uh, but the, the first mistake, he came in and he looked up at the stack and saw our Apollo spacecraft up there. Now, now, understand, he was there where they built the booster. The booster is what? Six or seven story, uh, stories tall, a big, high, big, monstrous thing that makes our spacecraft look small. So he looks up at it, and he goes in a kind of an accent, and I'm not going to try to, anyhow, he tells me that uh, it sure is a little thing, isn't it? Well, that got, that aroused my competitive <laughs> spirit right away. It really, <laughs> it really did. So here's Dr. Warner Von Braun, you know, and he's telling me this looks small. He, he walks around, he's still looking at it, and he's, he kept going on that it's still small, and my blood just started boiling more and more and more and more. And I remember Ida, Take it easy, take a deep breath, you know, and so I'm not doing that. So, uh, 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 he said something else, and I looked at it. I said, well, you know, uh, what you're building is the booster. Its purpose is to take the most important part of Apollo to the moon. Okay, that got his attention. Okay. So we're going back and forth like that. 
And finally, I just stop, and he puts his hand on my, he says, that's okay, we understand each other, Mr. Cass, we understand each other. He puts his hand on my shoulder, and I froze. And I didn't want him to do that. I, and, and, I, and, and he put his hand on my, he says, I know what the problem is. He says, uh, you're thinking about the missiles that we sent to France, to, to England. I said, that's right. I said, I said, I'm thinking about that. And I'm trying not to, but I am thinking about you and the master behind, the mastermind behind those missiles. And I know that the United States has forgiven you and, and I have too, but I can't help this respond. He says, yeah, well, let me see if I can help you. He says, you were responsible for all of those Titan missiles aimed at us. And uh, uh, can you say that you were any more sanctified about it? He didn't use that word, he used another word that I can't recall. But then, then I am, he says, we sent the missile because we was ordered to do that. If you were ordered to fire those missiles, would you not have fired them? All right, for the first time, you know, I kind of saw this, this side of it. Uh, uh, I'm telling you these things because I don't want you to get the impression that I'm telling you that I'm perfect. I'm not perfect. I'm not near perfect. Uh, another uh, a problem that uh, uh, I had to learn how to forgive. And uh, this had to do with one of the astronauts. I'm not going to mention his name. Uh, 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 after the Apollo fire, uh, one of the astronauts, uh, during that kind of a time, uh, you, you, you want to start blaming somebody. You, the people died, you know, and you got to blame somebody for this. Well, uh, this particular astronaut uh, uh, did something that NASA asked him not to do. Stay away from the press. Nobody talks until we get all this thing together. And he uh, went to the press and uh, and he had a big feature story, and the only thing he could think of was that it was my engineers. Well, you know, I'm like a mother hen, you know. You could say that about my engineers, and there was nothing that said uh, that my engineers were at fault. For, and, and not only that, it didn't happen in Downey, it happened down at the Cape. It was, certainly wasn't under our control. And, uh, and, he, and the other astronauts told him, you don't want to make that guy. He's the one that's going to send us up there. You better go back and apologize to him. So he comes back and he does. He apologizes, and uh, and I would not even accept his hand. I, I would not forgive him. And uh, so we had an open night, open uh, to to the spouses. The astronaut, I'm sorry, the astronaut crew wanted to invite the executives at the uh, spouses, and it was a very rainy night. And I started not to take Ida, but I thought, you better go anyhow. So she went with me. And uh, this particular astronaut uh, was chairing the, uh, the, 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 the meeting. And he was very gracious. And after it was over, he came down and offered his hand to me again. I wouldn't take it. He just took Ida, escorted her through. He was, he was, he, he was being very careful. He took her through. And this is what your husband does. And he all these see of of, of, of offices and desks, this is all you know, his, and upstairs, that's your husband, and I would not forgive him. And uh, uh, I did not forgive him, and, and you know, again, I'm talking to Ida, and I'm talking to uh, uh, Dr. Chetty, and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and I'm, I'm mellowing a bit, you know, come on, come on, loosen up, Norman. You know, so, so one day I decide, and this is the bad part of it, that, I mean, this is how I learned how to forgive. Uh, I decided, you know, it's time for me to forget that guy. And he's, he's offered his hand to me, and it's all over now. It's time to forgive. So I decided I would find him. I knew I would find the astronauts, and I did. I found him. He died two days later. Oh. Two days earlier before that. Oh. Well, you know, that was a kind of a shocking thing uh, to, to me. I mean, to have that, uh, to have that happen, and... Uh, that's one of the times that I, uh, that was the time that I really learned about forgiving. And, uh, and I'm not going to say that I'm a totally a forgiving person now, but, uh, but I've learned to let them. Then there was another incident. On the Titan II program at, 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 in the, uh, the, the deserts uh, of Tucson, Arizona, they're spread all over, 18 missile sites. 18 missile sites. And uh, I had to work a crew late one night. The countdown wasn't going well. The fuel wasn't taking off. We were getting red lights for fuel, red lights for guidance. 
uh, incidentally, for you who were in electronics, the Titan had one real uh, interesting guidance system. This inertia guidance system was one that told you where you were, told you where you were by telling you where you were not. Or I could say that in a different way. And that was the inertia guidance system. So we're, we're having all kinds of problems with inertia guidance system and everything else. And I kept them in, uh, in there late. I say men and the ladies don't get upset. There were no ladies in, in doing things like that in those days. Remember, I'm old. <laughs> Goes back. I was around when Einstein was still around. And that's a fact. That is a fact. Uh, so, uh, 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 so I said, if you stay with me for a little longer, what I'll do is uh, we'll go, we'll go and, and eat lunch together. So we got to a point where we could go, we could go to a hold. We set the generators, and generators on hold, and all of that. And we went to uh, went to this restaurant in Tucson, Arizona. There's about 40 or 50 people, engineers, and they're all they're all working for me. So we go into this restaurant, and uh, and they order some to the delight of the owner, uh, as some hundred and so you know some of them ordered two hamburgers and. And they're getting extra people. They're going to put all these hamburgers on the grill. On the grill. So I'm sitting at the uh, counter. This is Tucson, Arizona. So the man comes to me and tells me that he can't serve me because they don't serve black people there. Oh. Well, <laughs> you know the funny thing about that is is there was one man who I thought he just hates my guts. He did, he wouldn't look at me, and I thought, okay. That's what I have to go through. I've got this color of my skin. I can, I can either grieve about that or I can look at that scientifically in, 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 in a management sort of a way. It's just like you got one arm cut off, you got to try to deal with that. Don't complain about it. Go ahead and deal with that. You only got one leg, you got to, got to deal with that. And I've got this color of skin, I've got to deal. i got to somehow go around. That was, that's how I got through all of this. So, uh, uh, they wouldn't think he said, what serve me? This man from Georgia, who I thought just couldn't stand me, he speaks up and says, you can't talk to that man that way. That's my boss. Well, I was just <laughs> shocked, you know. And, uh, and, uh, and he spoke up for me, and the other spoke up. And I said, well, we can't help him. He, you, we can't serve him here. You know what happened? They walked out of that restaurant and left about 150 hamburgers. Everybody, no one, no, no one stayed. Period. Not one of them did. Not one of them. They all got up and walked out of that restaurant and left that and and, and left him standing. And and they said, "We'll go to another." I said, "I don't want to go through this again." They said, "No, no, no. We know this place." So we went to the other place. But there's another part to that story, and that's the. I'm telling you how I learned how to forgive and how aerospace taught me that. I'm sorry, babe. You didn't know about this. <laughs> One of my goals was to become a millionaire by the time I was 40. And I, I missed it by, by a few months. And... Uh, but one of the things that I mentioned that, that I thought that I'm going to do, I'm, I've got to get that, I've got to get back at those people. Now, say you might say, well, yeah, but the, the, this racial stuff, you could take that. You looked at that scientific. What was the problem there? Well, the problem was that was personal. The other thing is, okay, that's the thing that my, that my color. I can accept that. That's where it's going to be. I can fight that. But that was personal. That embarrassed me in front of my employees, and that was too much. So I decided I'm gonna you're, you're gonna I'm gonna make you suffer for that. One of the things in big business that you you'll be aware of, you wonder why we don't go around hating each other all the time. Well, the reason is because we understand that that can eat you up like a cancer, just like a cancer. So what we do is we just simply say we'll write out a a a procedure as to how we're going to get even with you. We'll write that procedure out. And you write that out, now you're satisfied. You don't have to go around, hey, you already got this thing, but the thing is, by the time in another month or two, you would have forgotten all about it, nothing ever happened. But in this case, it was going to happen because that was where I took that person. Excuse me, babe. 
you're really not going to like this. <laughs> <laughs> so I commissioned uh, a lawyer and a real estate agent. And I wanted them to track his mortgage. And one day they called me and they said, he's so many months behind and his mortgage is up to sale for sale. You want to buy it? I said, buy it. Yeah, I did that. I did that. I said, buy it. And uh, my intent was not pure. I was going to buy it and burn the place down. I'm, I, I vowed to tell the truth. Okay? So, and, but I'm, and I'm learning, tell, telling you how I learned about forgiveness. And so uh, I went to Arizona and uh, I walked into that place. Uh, before I walked in, the lawyers and so on walked in and everybody introduced them to the uh, new owners of the mortgage. And I walked in. Well, he didn't remember who I was, so I reminded him. And the look on his face just was devastating. And then I thought about Ida again, and I thought about uh, how I'm going to have to change. It can't be this way. And and I walked back out. He was in, he was at this man was in despair, total despair, and I could see that. And that that bothered me that I was causing that. And I was causing that uh, because he was doing something that people did in those days. He, it, it was something that uh, he thought he should do. He was wrong, but he, that's what he did. And uh, I didn't want to be the one to cause him uh, additional suffering, especially uh, the horror in his face when I told him that uh, that, that was my original, that my intent, when I, uh, it was to burn the place down. Buy to buy it all up and then burn it down, and uh, and and I changed that, but I didn't change it until I walked out. I admit, probably because I wanted him to suffer just a bit more. Uh, we walked out with my lawyers and and the uh, and the whole group of us documentation people, and we stood there on the porch. They had, they, there was a porch. He had a. It was it was a wooden building, and there was a a porch with with chairs chairs. Uh, what do you call them? These relaxing chairs in it, and uh, and we sat down in the chairs, and we were talking with him still on the inside. And I gave the instructions to remove all the uh, 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 all of the uh, hostility from him and uh, let him know that I'm the one that's removing it from him. And and I took note, one of the lawyers reminded me, he said, what, what are you gonna do? Even though you do that, he's still three months in arrears. I said, pay it. At that time I could, it, it wasn't a big deal to me. And I said, oh, yeah, pay it. And they said, I said, see it. And, and one of them said something, I said, pay it. And they and they got the and and they went back in and told and I, I don't know exactly what their worrying was to him, but they my understanding is that they told him all what I had done in his favor, and that I had done it uh, out of the goodness of my heart, and uh, and I wanted him to know it. I wanted him to know it, and I wanted him to always be thinking about that uh, the next time a black person walks in that restaurant. And those are, those are, those are almost my exact, my exact words. But it's something that uh, that I felt that I needed to, to tell you because I'll be telling you some other things and you'll be praising me about that, but I want you to know that there was a, not necessarily a dark side. Even if it was a dark side, it's one that I hope pain. So now I want to go into uh, how I got into the program. Now, I didn't always want to be an engineer. Uh, I always, I, do you remember the Americana magazine? Does anybody remember the Americana magazine? So, okay, I see a lot of you nodding your head, yeah. Well, it's a, it, it had a red cover on it, remember that one? And in the front of that magazine, it, uh, it showed, it had a, a, a photograph of a solar system and of the universe. 
and uh, it showed the planets going around the Earth and the different planets. And at that time, it was nine. And, <laughs> well, you know, I laugh about Clyde when that was discovered. You know, and that was just, I was just being born when that was when that was discovered uh, of Pluto. So uh, I saw this, and I was looking at that, and then it showed the, the different universes. And I had never seen anything like that. I mean, my world was small comparatively. And then it said that uh, the stars were really suns for every other planet. Now, that, you talk about blowing somebody's mind. That was just too much. I thought about that. I mean, these stars are just suns like ours, and that's what these things are? And, the, 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 and I thought, that is just fantastic. And that's when I thought, I want to get into aerospace. I, I want to learn more about the stars. And, and uh, 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 I was going to a little school, college, and you know, you can hardly call it that. And during those days, they had the uh, 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 predominantly black colleges. And uh, they, they weren't well kept. They didn't have the funding. Uh, uh, they might be very small schools, maybe three or four hundred uh, the students said that many, and even if it was a state school, it wasn't funded because nobody at that time cared that much for uh, for the uh, black schools. And uh, uh, I was on the varsity basketball team. I know what you're thinking. You're not tall enough. Two kids got big. <laughs> really? Really? You did? You guys are giants now compared to us. And somebody my age, speak up and say, yes, I remember that. You, you, nobody my age? <laughs> uh, more? No? No, you're not. I'm older than you. Okay. Well, anyhow, uh, 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 George is back there. George Williams, I know he's older than I am, so George knows exactly what I'm talking about. I was on, on a varsity basketball team, and not only at that time was I one of the tallest on the team, I was one of the tallest in the league. <laughs> and I was playing a, 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 a guard. I was playing guard at that time for, for Delaware State. And uh, uh, the buildings were, were old. I was at a hall called Jason Hall. And uh, all of us on the basketball team stayed in that, in that hall. And there was only one light switch. You could come in, and all of us in bed, you got up, and you had to walk quite a distance. So, uh, uh, Amy Watson says to me, "You know, you got that. You know all this stuff. Fix us, fix up something for us. So I got some strings and some ropes, and I figured up something that uh, with a, with the rope hanging from each 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 bed. All they had to do was pull that rope, and that would turn that light on. And Amy Watson said at that time, "You know, you ought to be an engineer." My mother wasn't too easy about me thinking about becoming an engineer. First of all, that incident that happened. Uh, when I was pronounced dead, she felt that I was destined to be a minister. My, my mother, I, I, I think I was, I was a disappointment to her when she died that I didn't, because she felt that what I received was a gift from God and I was wasting it on engineers. And, uh, and she, 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 she mentioned that many times. It wasn't just her, it was the person equivalent to a deacon who was saying that also. Well, well, how that all happened is... Uh, uh, they had a secretary of the convention, and uh, 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 they asked me to be the secretary. Well, it was unprecedented. They asked me to be the secretary for three years because I got all the notes right. So now my mother and the bishop, they're talking about, okay, we're, we're, you're going into the ministry. I said, no, I'm not that smart. I just have a good memory. I'm trying to tell them that. This is, this is a memory thing. And... Uh, 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 with Amy Watson telling me that I should uh, go into uh, be a doc, be a engineer, somebody else was telling me about medicine. So I looked at medicine and I talked to some of the doctors and I visited some of the hospitals. You're not going to like this thing. <laughs> <laughs> so I visited some of the hospitals and and. Uh, there was something about being a doctor that I didn't like. I felt that I had enough problems with this color of this skin that I got to work that I don't have to worry about all this consternation that you got to put up with senior doctors over the resident doctors. 
I, I just I just felt it was totally unnecessary. So some of the doctors would set me down and said, well, there's a reason for that. That we have to train them and we have to uh, be patient with them. We have to school them along. And, I, and they said, you won't get that in engineering. In engineering, if you don't know it, they're going to get rid of you. And I thought, you know, I think I'll take that risk. <laughs> and and I, I did take that risk. And uh, uh, I, I don't know why my mother had all of these medical books. Where she got them from, I don't have the slightest idea. But she had all of these medical books, and I was reading all that stuff. So I finally decided I was going to be in, in engineering. But something happened. I couldn't get mad. And there was a reason for it. Uh, but this memory got me in trouble when I was in, in the fir first or second grade. Uh, uh, the teacher was explaining something, and she made a mistake and got it wrong. Me, like a fool, I spoke up, and that did not go over good with her. <laughs> it did not. It just absolutely did not. And she, uh, 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 in those days, teachers could hit you. I mean, and you, you know, you just, it wasn't just a parent you had to worry about. If you get told the line, you're, you're, you're not only your teachers, but even the neighbors. <laughs> and, you know, it was that kind of a thing. That's the kind of community thing. It was it? Am I telling the truth about that? Yeah, Some you people, yeah. you know, I am. Yeah. So, uh, 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 so, so, so. Uh, during that period of time, uh, I thought I thought that the sun rose and set on the teacher. But that teacher looked at me, and I knew that she was angry. And she said, "What do you mean that uh, there was?" I said, "Well, because you taught us this, and it was." She said, "Yeah, but what do you mean corrected me?" And well, I, 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 I don't know what I said, but she slapped me so hard my head hit the backboard, and I saw stars. I, I was really, I, I was really hurting, and I, 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 you know, there's no point in, I know what you're saying, go home and tell your parents, you, you know, if I went home and told my parents, I got to yes, <laughs> <laughs> Am I telling the truth? Or don't yeah. you know that? I see, that's right. So in those days, that's what would have happened. So I didn't tell them, uh, but I wouldn't participate in any math. I wouldn't. And the math teachers didn't understand, they just thought I was dumb. I didn't know, I just didn't understand. I was sitting there going through all that bad in my head and I would not raise my head and the, and, and the teacher just thought I didn't know. One day, and you know, you remember these teachers. Her name was Ella Bottle Cooks. And she was just a little lady who walked like this, just like this. And she smoked those funny brown cigarettes. <laughs> now I, I it, they could be roll your own in those days because they were rolling your own. I'm not accusing her of, uh, but, I did, but she did. And uh, everybody was afraid of her. She didn't smile. She was no nonsense. She was science. And uh, one day she put a, 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 a calculation up on the board and she says, this is how you solve that. So she finished her calculation and she says, all right, somebody tell me the answer. And nobody raised their hand, and she called on me. And I thought, oh, you know, I'm scared now. And okay, you know, I don't want to go through this with another teacher. <laughs> and I'm scared. And she said, and she said, what is the number? I go, oh, whatever it is, I told her what it was. And I, I, immediately, I knew I was in trouble, I thought. And, and she said, it's time for the class to go. And she dismissed the class, and she says, Norman, I want you to stay. I thought, okay. <laughs> <laughs> This is it. So I, 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 I stayed, and she says, I want you to sit down. How did you know that? I said, you told us. You told us. She said, but just once, how did you know that? I said, Miss Tooks, you told us. I'm, you know, I'm being defensive. I'm really being defensive. And she, there was no need for me to be defensive. She just wanted to know how I knew that. And I said, but you taught us before. She said, I only told you once that something, you don't get that the first time. And, uh, and she says, why haven't you been raising your hand? You know this. Why haven't you been raising your hand in the class? I said, I, said, I, I, I just, just didn't. She kept, she drilled me and just finally I told her what it happened. She said, you've never told any of the other teachers? I said, no. And she said, you've got a brain that needs to be developed. And Ms. Tooks, 
took her time at night schooling me, taking me through all the aspects of mathematics and giving me all that, that, that extra instruction at night. And when I told some of the other te kids about that, uh, I never told them until about 30 or 40 years later, they just couldn't believe that this, this took for that. So with, with that, I decided I'm, I'm really going to be an engineer. It was a struggle because I was also a musician. Uh, that didn't go over well. It did not because I wasn't a good musician. Uh, my aunt Susie taught me and, and her son uh, the piano, and we aspired to be classical pianists. For your information, most of the concert scores today, even the, 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 including the concertos, well, I could sit down and play those. Today, my hands are not that good because I got arthritis, arthritis in my fingers, but I can still run some Bach, Brahms, and, and one of my favorites, uh, Franz Litz. Uh, before you, and I could do big, big band stuff, and I'll tell you how that happened. So, so, uh, 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 so, uh, so, Miss Tooks teaches, teaches me. I've now become an engineer. I decided not to be a doctor, and and I, I'm into music. I decide I want to study music. I wasn't sure about whether it's going to be engineering or what. Then I had this love for music. I started studying music. Went overseas and uh, decided I'm going to come back and try to do some uh, classical music. Had an arrangement to uh, play uh, for some concert in Baltimore, and uh, they pulled the bill back when they found out that I was black. They just not, were not ready. Now, that doesn't mean for everyone. There was a quota system in those days. I know you don't want to hear about the word quota. But see, the quota first, <laughs> the quota first was against us. That was a quota. There, were, when I went in the Air Force, I wanted to be in, in, in a, a, a flying status, which I was, but I also wanted to be a pilot. I applied for flying school, flight school, and when I took the test, they came back and told me I failed the test. Well, you knew I was going to buy that. That just didn't make sense that I failed some easy test like that, but I, I did, and uh, so uh, uh, I, I lamented about that. And uh, some of the young men from the ordinary room, two of them, I won't mention their names, they're probably still alive, came and said they, they changed their scores. And uh, I said, why did they do that? I said, because there's a quota for the number of, of, uh, of black officers in flying school. So then they changed and they got a new uh, 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 commander. So the commander called me and said, I understand you went to go to flying school. I said, yes. I said, what I was doing, he says, he says Okay, there were some problems there, but I can get you in now. And I thought, okay. I said, wait a minute. If I go to flying school now, is is is, is there another quota for second lieutenant for th uh, first lieutenant and captain on up? He says, I I think so, but you you could get you could get through. I says, well, maybe I'm not. You know, I'm very competitive. I could see myself being the oldest second lieutenant in the village in the service. I wasn't going to buy that for anybody. Being a second lieutenant, that just just, just that was not going to happen. So uh, I said, well, what are you going to do? I said, uh, I said I'll take the, the rank that I had. And so they, when I told them that I was not, I got wounded. I, I was wounded. And uh, I had to stay in the hospital for a long period of time. And uh, as, as a result of that, uh, they took me off flying school, flying status. She mentioned that, Katrina mentioned that, and that was a devastating time in my life. They took me off the off flying status. Uh, and, uh, but back to flying school, I told them I, I didn't want to be the oldest second lieutenant. I decided I was going to get out. So if you're going to get out in strategic air command, anybody in here been in SAC? Any SAC lawyer? You know what I'm talking about. General, but another SAC lawyer goes, oh, I know that, yeah. So when you're in strategic air command, that's a different air force. That looks like combat air force. And uh, and uh, if, you're, if you're not going to stay in, you're not going to get the promotion. So I stayed a sergeant. And uh, 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 they canceled the engineering system for all the airplanes when they when the jets came in. There used to be an engineer that sat up there as part of the crew. And they 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 pulled the engineers off and they regretted it. Because they still had problems that the crew could not access. And some of them, some of those problems, 
uh, could only uh, uh, occur uh, when the active, I won't get that detail, when the, there's, there's a landing switch, gear activation switch on the airplane. And uh, it senses when the gear, when the, when the wheels are up. And some of it, you, you, you can actually kludge around that. Am I getting quite too detailed? You can actually kludge around that and, uh, and make the system think that the, the gear is up. But you can't fool those Android sys uh, switches, those evacuated bellows, uh, unless you go in and expose them to pressures. And when you do that, that disrupts the calibration. So the best thing, I'm sorry to get the detail. Okay. The best thing to do is to go airborne. And so I was on flying status anyhow. I got to fly the B-52s, the, 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 the K-135s. During the, during the peak of the, of, the, of the Cold War, that the president had called for us to go in and bomb uh, 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 the Soviet Union, I would have been an unwilling participant. I would have been on that airplane also. So uh, I was on flying status, and the flight surgeons, for well, more you know, the flight surgeons, they're, they're our friends, and the, uh, what they did is they uh, decided that uh, uh, I could no longer be on flying status. So if I was on flying status, uh, uh, I had to leave the service. So I left the service. But I like I liked being in missiles, rockets, and airplanes and things. So I stayed with the military as a civilian. And uh, uh, as a civilian, I was doing almost the same thing that I was doing as a military guy, except instead of working with airplanes, I was now working with the most deadliest, menacing, system the world has ever known the Titan one missile that was capable of being launched and landing on its target from six thousand miles away. Uh, that's 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 menacing. And uh, you might say, well, oh what were we talking about? We, we were trying to show the Soviet Union we had stuff too. Don't attack us if you do it's gonna be a major problem. So uh, 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 I'm now on the Air Force. I'm into my career now. So I'm into in the Air Force. Uh, I, I finished the uh, uh, B-52s. I received several awards. B-52. One thing I did want to tell you about, and uh, Katrina mentioned it, I was on this uh, troubleshooting team. And uh, if an airplane was in trouble and the ground crew pulled and you touch that kind of stuff, and you wish that you, you hadn't touched it. So it was spewing liquids and people all standing back. And, and I'm trying to remember, where have I seen this before? And, and I'm supposed to go out there and, and fix that. So I put on this special gear that I had, you know, the hoods and all this, the shoes. And, and, um, and, I, and, and so my guy says, what, what are we going to do? I said, give me a minute. I try to think, try to think. And then I remember a Boeing. It wasn't in any of our tech order, but it was a, a Boeing uh, uh, flyer or something. That this something like that happened to them once. And what they did, uh, they, they found that the event valve was stuck, cold, it was frozen. And what you had to do was to get that vent valve uh, open. There were a couple ways of doing it, but you have to be careful because the liquid oxygen was dangerous. So they, and, and one of the ways of doing it was either putting a, 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 a heater around it, and you have to be careful that you don't have any sparks in it, you're going to blow up the airplane and yourself too. Or there's another way of doing it, is opening, trying to get that vent valve open all the way and then let it slam shut. And I thought, do I dare do that? Do I dare do that? But the thing is, the liquid oxygen is spewing from twice the distance, and it's just throwing that liquid oxygen everywhere and all. And when it, when it hits, it hits and it bubbles oils and it's just deadly you look at that and uh, so I put on my gear and I told the, my guys I said, move everybody back and uh, yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know babe <laughs> yeah. so so uh, I walk up to the to the to the airplane and I looked at that vent valve, and uh, I thought, what if I, what if it breaks? You understand that? You know, the, you know, you understand super cooling. I mean, what if it, what if, what if due to the, uh, to the deterioration of the metal resulting from that cold temperature, what if it just breaks? You know, that thing does happen. 
And I said, well, here goes. So I put my hand on that vent valve, closed my eyes, and went up. And, and the oxygen just freed. O oxygen was everywhere. And everybody was looking, oh my gosh, the oxygen was flowing everywhere. And they were moving back. And then I released it. And I'm saying, go back, baby, go back. And I did, and it went boom. And oxygen stopped just like that. Well, and actually, that made me a hero. <laughs> <laughs> yes. The oxygen, liquid oxygen just stopped. And uh, I contacted Boeing after that. And I said, you guys better put that in your in the tech order. You you know, you've got to, people got to know about that. Uh, uh, so uh, I left the Air Force and became a civilian feather merchant. That's what they called us civilians in those days. You guys all know that. That's what they called us. And I was I was now doing the same thing for the Air Force except with missiles. And uh, uh, Ida and I were on our way to Moses Lake, Washington. And uh, it was cold up there. Ida, accustomed to warmer weather, but she did very well up there. And it was up there that the ladies, we, we, they had all these, a trailer village up there. And we lived in a trailer that was 60 by 10 feet. Uh, very nice uh, trailers. And all the engineers uh, lived, in, did, lived in those trailers. And uh, uh, we'd go off every morning, and every morning the ladies would talk about, we don't know when you're coming back, and every time something happened, uh, they would put it in the press, and the ladies, and I and all the rest of them would get all upset. And, uh, uh, but but if, if, if you're thinking about going into engineering, uh, I don't want to scare you. If you young people are thinking about going into engineering, just understand that you can become an engineer or an aerospace engineer. There's, there's, it's two different. There's a difference in the salary also. The aerospace engineer is going to make a lot more money than the regular engineer. If you want to be an engineer and you want to settle down and have a nice life, become a city engineer. <laughs> or an engineer of the county. That's, 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 that's the safest one to do. But if, if, uh, because if, if you want to become an aerospace engineer, you've got to, be, you've got to know that you're going to travel, uh, that the jobs are flowing one time and they may not be flowing the next. And you've got to know that there's some, it's, it's hazardous. Uh, 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 you, will, you will become involved with hazardous materials. And you've got to know how to respect it. Uh, you've got to know a little bit about chemistry here. Uh, you, have to, you have to understand and re have to respect. Uh, uh, if you don't, you're going to get yourself in trouble and you're going to get someone else in trouble. Uh, I had a couple major problems, and, and, and one of them I didn't do well at all. And I'm going down through the countdown. You know, when you're the test conductor, you're running everything. All the subcontractors, everything. Everybody's responsible to you. So I'm, I'm going through the countdown, and, and I'm saying, okay, ECS, give me a go. And getting all these goes, and everybody said, okay, we're ready. We're now ready to load locks. Now, they're all stationed, stand by. We're about to load locks. Uh, up above boards, this is above ground because the silos are way deep in the ground. And, and he's, oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I'll, 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 I'll get to that one in just a minute. Very good. So the silos are, 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 are below ground and, and you're, loading, you're loading locks and uh, uh, things can go wrong. At that time, I'm saying, load locks. I'm giving the order. You know, I'm very proud of myself. I've got this, do this, do that, and it gets done, do this, and I'm ready now. We're going to load lock. When you are an integrated test conductor, that has nothing to do with racial. It just means integrating all the systems. <laughs> You've got to, you have the responsibility of everything, not just all the systems that you know. So I said, load locks. Nothing happened. Load locks, I go, you know, load locks. Then I'm going to get up my authoritative voice, you know, and uh, load locks. So we go, he says, TC, we're not ready to load yet. We've got to get some samples. We've got to get the, to make sure the QDs are clean. Uh, the the, uh, the truck has got to be in position. And then that's what I learned. You just messed up, Norman. You just messed up, and you are really going to hear it. And at that time, I thought you are going to get fired for that. 
and uh, 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 because I did not, I, I did not do what I was supposed to do. So when you're in aerospace engineering, you have to understand your job and you have to do all of it. Uh, as, as a result of that, we delayed that countdown for some seven or eight hours. That was my fault. And another time, during the purging of a line, uh, 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 of, 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 the, of the line that, that, you, that you, for, for the flow of the liquid oxygen, one of the dumbest things, and I, I regret this, and it's fortunate, unfortunate that nobody got killed. But this is how you learn those things. I gave the direction to purge the line, and, I, and the safety engineer up, up top side did not tell me that, that there were people standing there. So you know what happened. So we purged that line. That thing was going around like a snake. If I tell the truth, God, you know I am, right? That thing was going around like a snake. And it's just fortunate that it didn't hit anybody. So uh, I, I, I learned a lesson there also. But there was another time. I didn't know whether we were going to live through that one or not. Uh, we were at the propellant terminal of a, of a Titan One missile. And this is where I've been telling Ida everything is safe. And uh, a valve got stuck or something, and the, 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 the propellant terminal, anybody been on Titan Ones? The propellant terminal became full of gaseous oxygen. It was very quick, full of gaseous oxygen. Now, that is one of the last things that you want to happen. All you need is a spark and you can say goodbye. So I had all these men down there, and I said, don't anybody move. Don't anybody move. we got to figure something out. I got a call from the uh, uh, central control station. I said, how are things going? I said, there are no problems that require more than the usual testing coordination. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, you know, you know, if, if I explained what was what was happening, then I'd have to go through a long list of all the things that was happening, and by that time we could have been blowing up, and I didn't want that. So I told the guys, I said, uh, "This is this is what we're going to do." I said, the first thing, I'm going to let any of you who want to pray do so now." That's the first thing I did. I said, "Now don't don't, don't stuff on your feet, don't slide your feet." And I want, and I told why I said, I want you to go over to a certain panel. So I said, well, I don't want you to touch that. I just want you to look up at it. Because the, the oxygen was so thick, you could not see two feet in front of you. It was just that thick. So uh, 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 I said, here's what I'm thinking about. There are fans down in the silo that are supposed to take care of this. They're supposed to be the kind that, that do not spark, anti-spark. A lot of money was made for the construction of those fans, especially for that. Now, what we've got to rely on is the subcontractor who built those. You got me, guys. I see. We've got to rely on that subcontractor. If, 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 if there's a problem, let's say goodbye to each other. Maybe right now. I beg, look, now take it easy. <laughs> so, you know, this is really bad on you. I know it is. I, I have to. I have to. <laughs> I, I know, you know. I know that's really rough on them. So, so, I said, I'm going to give you a countdown, and at that time, I want you to hit that switch. And I want you to hit it hard. I don't want any opportunity for it to, for it to spark. Hit it hard, and I said, uh, you're, you're on my mark, and I just paused, and I thought, oh, I've got to do it. And, you know, it, it was just building up more and more and more, and I got to do it. It's, I got to do something. So I uh, said, a prayer. you know, they say uh, 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 com combatants in the military, the foxholes and something, uh, you're not going to find an atheist in a foxhole. <laughs> You'll find very few in most of in, in the uh, aerospace engineering. So I said a little prayer. And I said, Has everybody said the prayer? He said, yes. I said, okay, here we go. And I went, five, four, three, two, one, mark. Oh, I mean, you know that fans are so powerful. 
these things were powerful, and it was just sucking that, that oxygen out very quickly, and in about the six minutes or so, that you could hardly tell that there was any, any problem in there at all. But we still had a problem. All that oxygen was in our clothes. So uh, uh, we stayed as long as we could to get the oxygen out of our clothes, and then uh, we had the, the clothes sent down, clothing sent down to us, which we put them in a bag, and we put on club clothing and walked up, and uh, went home that night and kissed Ida, and said everything went fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, you know. <laughs> But you know, I is okay. She she figures all this stuff out. She, you know, I I, I, I was coming back from a, a long sortie. Sometimes it was B 52s you know, up for seventy two hours, and I was tired. And they were telling me that they were going to bring this exciting young woman for me to meet. And I said, I don't want to meet any exciting. I said, I got to go through my checklist and all of this. And uh, so it, it, so so Mac's wife was insisting that when I. As soon as I come in, I should go and get my shower and go take and, and come to that party, come to, come out there and to, to the stand. And I said, I'm, finally they convinced me. So I, I, I was feeling very bad. I got to the table. I sat at the table. I didn't even look up. I, I didn't feel like it. I just held my head down and I just decided I'm not going to do anything. I'm not going to participate in this mess. So they were talking and I and 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 Max's wife was elbowing me to say something. She was elbowing me. And, I'm, I, and, and Ida was sitting across the table. She was, she was the one. So uh, I, I, uh, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm sitting there, and finally Joe Carter asked Ida to dance. Okay? Now, we're gentlemen in those days. I'm not saying you young guys aren't gentlemen. <laughs> Did I say that? <laughs> I said, no, no. I, I'm just saying in those days, you know, we opened doors for ladies. And, and, that they they we treated ladies like queens. And, uh, well, you know, we, we did. And they were they, they're queens of our heart. So we opened doors for them. Uh, uh, if, if, they, if, if, if they stood up at the table, we stood up. They approached the table, we stood up. We stood up until they sat down. So uh, I just stood up as Joe Carter came up to dance with her. So naturally, I had to stand up, and I got to look at Ida out of my eyes, and I went. Hmm. <laughs> well, you know how we guys are. You know we, we see things, and uh, I saw, and she when she walked up to the floor, and I thought, very stately, very nice, very stately, and I was I was very impressed. And she came back to the table, and uh, and Joe Carter wanted to dance again or something like that, and I thought, okay, Joe, your night's over. <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, 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 so uh, uh, I, I applied some pressure, let's put it that way, applied some pressure, and I thought about my checklist, and uh, after a while, I just thought, I tore up my checklist and said, oh well, <laughs> <laughs> and she, she has met, really met the requirements of that checklist even without me here, checking, she's, she's just been all the things that, that, that happened because she didn't put pressure. She put pressure on me, I would not have been able to go through and, and do all the things that I did. Now, after being responsible for 18 missile bases and going through all that, I had enough of Titan. And they were sending me to the Titan Update program. I didn't want to go. I didn't want to go to Denver. Nothing against Denver. I couldn't breathe up there. And, and secondly, I didn't want to. Uh, uh, Back, it was just boring. So uh, a headhunter approached me and uh, told me about the Apollo program. And I already told you I didn't believe them, uh, but uh, uh, they asked me to go and check it out. I did, and uh, went and had a physical. I still hadn't decided, and I went and uh, 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 got evaluated, and pretty soon. We were on our way to Los Angeles, California. Now, you know this picture here. This is me as a young man. This is this this is uh, Harry Peck, one of the engineers, and up there is Leroy Miller, one of my uh, general managers over the technicians. And this is uh, uh, the spacecraft that has returned. When the spacecraft returns, uh, what happens is that we are the first ones to open the hatch 
look inside and just make sure that it's safe because when it comes back from the from the uh, moon, those 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 spacecraft are not safe. My engineers actually went to the splashdown base. Where's more? Uh, that's one of the things that uh, Moore does. He's here, he's by the docents here at the museum, and uh, he meets the astronauts. And he's one of the first medical authorities. He's, he's one of the first medical authorities uh, when the, the, to meet the astronauts and check them out to make sure they're okay. Uh, so Morton and I, from that standpoint, we're we're, we're veterans. So we're looking in the in the spacecraft, and this is me when I was a young man. Okay. Now, next one, there's a difference, I know. But before you say anything, I suggest you look in the mirror, too. <laughs> 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 Didn't become the executive for nothing. Right? <laughs> so that's me. Yes, that's, uh, that's uh, about 42 years later. And, uh, I'm looking at the space uh, How did that happen? Thank you. I'm sorry about that. Sorry about that. So what happened is is uh, is, is Steve Hanks here? Well, he's up there. Okay. And is Jeffrey Gessen here? Where is Jeffrey? Oh, okay. 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 It's my grandson, and his wife. Hi. So. Uh, uh, these two people are responsible for me being here today because my when I left the program, I did, went into some other things and then I became a, a, a consultant. Uh, I have a company, it's called uh, my name, uh, the, the Technical Management Consulting. What I do is I fill in for a, a chief executive uh, uh, who is absent. Now, chief executive officer can be absent because they start drinking too much, they have too much pressure, they have to go some medical treatment, they might uh, they might even die, or they might even have to go off to war, which is which is what the, the, this young man did. And uh, so while that happens, then I'll go in and fill in, I'll sit and become the CEO of that outfit. I can't tell you the names of them because I have to sign a non-serp, non-disc, uh, uh, agreement with them that I did not mention the names of them. So, uh, uh, so that's what I was doing when, at that time. I was uh, uh, I, I was into that position, and uh, I met Jeffrey. And uh, well, I mean, I met him before that. I know that that's why he convinced me, persuaded me to do this because I didn't I didn't work with small companies. I only it had to be a big company and billions of dollars. I wasn't going to fool with. Jeffrey had a small company. He convinced me, grandfather, this grandfather, you know, he's putting the pressure on me. So uh, I did agree uh, to take over his company. His company headquarters, is San Diego, California. So I'm coming here many times in San Diego, California, and there was a a man who worked there. Steve Hicks, he's the one that's got that light in my eyes right now. <laughs> and uh, uh, you, you can make change out any time you want to. So uh, uh, um, I had two hours before my airplane took off to take me back to Little Rock, Arkansas. Don't say anything. <laughs> I'll explain that. So I'm in Little Rock, Arkansas. I'm, I'm, I'm ready to go back to Little Rock, Arkansas. And we had to go out to North Island at that time, and we did everything. And I don't know how we got done so fast. We did all, went through the, the whole, all the buildings, did all of our business, and and got through very quickly. And I had about two hours to kill, was it, Steve? Yeah. And and Steve mentioned about an organ up here at Balboa Park, and I thought well, I'd like to see that because I used to play in the theater organ. If you older ones know, when you went to the theater to the movie. If they played the, 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 the organist with, oh, I used to do that also. So I wanted to see that organ. And uh, this, it, this, this is the same spacecraft. And this is, this is again, the young people who are youthful me. So I, I, I wanted to see that. And, and for some reason, Steve couldn't show it to me because it was closed. So now I've got to figure out what I'm going to do. This is, this is important. This is how I come to this museum. 
and uh, 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 he's trying to figure what to do to keep me busy. And he says, "Let's go to the music. I'm going to go to the music." He said, "They got all kinds of stuff in there. They understand they've got this Apollos. I don't want to see any mock-ups. I've been working with the real thing. I don't want to see any cardboard or soft fiberglass <laughs> mock-ups or anything like that." And finally, he convinced me to go in, and I went inside. Uh, you know, if Steve was down here now, I'd let him tell you, I was shocked. I looked at that spacecraft. Is, the, are these my attack bird? That's my baby, I think. Is that what I said? Yeah, that's, what you said. that's my baby. I looked, well, I could tell you, no. I, mean, you, I could see the burn pattern on the, on the uh, uh, not the athlete shield, but I could see the burn pattern. We, we can tell by a burn pattern whether the astronaut came in too steep, too lean, or just right. We can read those burn. And I knew that was a, that was a real McCoy. So there was a note, note there uh, to uh, not to touch the spacecraft, but nobody's going to stop me from touching my spacecraft. <laughs> <laughs> so I uh, I go up to the spacecraft, and uh, there, so so so. Steve Hicks tells the desk, you know, you're supposed to come in and you pay and go in. Steve says we're just going to be here for a short period of time. And he says, and he shows them, a, no. the man says no. Steve shows him a, a copy of, uh, of, a, of a picture. No. This one right here. Yeah. Yeah. He says, well, this man worked on this. He, he, he lived with this spacecraft. And uh, I, I'm not so sure he believed him. So I was walking up. I walked up there. And then finally, they believed him. When they called me to the desk and said, you've got to meet more. And uh, 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 so they carried us. I thought we walked 20 miles that day. I didn't know this place was so large. We walked, and I saw Mort with his red docents jacket. And with them, what they were in? Those jackets, there were about three or four of them there. And uh, 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 Mort and I said two words or two or three words to each other. We knew instantly that we were Apollo veterans. And uh, it was after that time that I became associated with, with this museum. Uh, on the, uh, 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 I think it was the 8th of, uh, of uh, October, no, it was the 4th of October, they gave me a red carpet uh, uh, tour of, uh, of the museum, and after that, uh, and my, my, the, the collection is also here, and, uh, uh, and, and to me, I feel very much at home here, because it's aerospace, it's aerospace all over, and uh, I, 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 I would encourage all of you who are interested in aerospace, and, and, and Jim uh, Kendrick did not ask me to do this. He didn't ask me to go on the selling thing. But, uh, but uh, you know, the way that these museums survive is, is through contributions. So if you're interested in aerospace, you might think about that. Uh, anyhow, the collection is going to be, my collection is here. Uh, uh, for those of you who missed it, my photograph uh, a life-size photograph of me at the Smith was at the Air and Space Museum at the Smithsonian Institute. Maybe some of you saw it. And if you did see that dark spot there, that was me. <laughs> well, you didn't see too many of them. <laughs> and, and that was me. Uh, 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 my big well, NASA, has well rewarded me. Uh, when I left the program, uh, uh, they made it possible. Uh, they in Rockwell, as a, as a reward, made it possible for me to go into business because I wanted my own aerospace business. I wanted to stop working for everybody else and, and go into aerospace. But I'm going to look at a couple of photographs first. Is it more? Yeah, there was more. Okay, let's fly some more. There's more than I standing together. And this is Apollo 9. That's why we're teaching Apollo 9. But we, we, for every spacecraft. Mort and I had a good understanding. Mort asked me some, some questions, you know, and I'm, you know, the, the, you know, since, uh, you know, you, I, I'm very proud of you. You guys have shown me around and, and you've done very well. And if you weren't, I'd have told you. <laughs> <laughs> you, 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 you. You know your business. Uh, you, you, You've been working with airplanes so long, you need to really get yourselves oriented just a bit more with missiles and rockets also, because you're going to see more and more of them now. 
but the, the docents are doing very well. These are the people that escort and uh, are touring you around the spacecraft, and uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased with them. So, uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Well, guys, gotta relax, you know. <laughs> this is how I relax. This is my music room at home, and uh, uh, all kinds of uh, things. I, I designed this music room, and this is where I go and, 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 and play. And uh, there are several, there are several uh, uh, news clippings. Uh, maybe some of you saw those, and I was also uh, interviewed by the likes of the Cronkites and so on during the uh, during the peak of Apollo. Uh, this picture here is can can you raise that up just a little bit so they can see? You? Can't do that. Huh? Okay, this these are the Russian cosmonauts. <coughs> these are the Russian cosmonauts visiting Apollo 11. Now the man here is Walt. Is uh, this is Gene Cernan? He's a well-known astronaut, and NASA wanted Gene Cernan to escort the cosmonauts to give them an understanding of the field from a, a flight standpoint, and he wanted to be there to give the technical details. And that's what I'm doing here. That's me, uh, uh, right there. That's me, and. Uh, uh, so, <laughs> so, and there's the interpreters there, and uh, I, at first I wasn't sure when they told me that the Russians were coming. I said, the Russians? I said, we've been trying to, they said, no, no, it's all over. We won that race, but now we've got to get together with them and do things together. I said, yeah, but am I supposed to do this? And I said, I need to have some kind of a direction. So I called the public relations, they said, it's clear all the way through. So I made a call to Houston, and they said, yes, it is. So I made a call to Washington, D.C., and they said it was. So uh, Gene Cernan asked me, he said, Norm, are we supposed to do this? I said, look, you're going to have to get your own clearance. I've got mine. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you're supposed to or not. So Gene makes a few phone calls. He comes back, and he says, I guess we've got to do it. So we stood there and waited, and we were very courteous to them. Uh, what, what is not shown is that as, soon after this, he wanted to get inside spacecraft. So I looked at Gene and I thought, nobody told us this. So uh, 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 I signaled my secretary, she made a call, and she comes back and she says, So uh, he got in the spacecraft and he said, uh, he says, now this is flying through the interpreter. He says, with ours, all we have to do is sit there, but this is really flying. They were very pleased. And he said, let's go to the moon, let's go to the moon. <laughs> so uh, 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 I, was, I was glad that was over. This uh, this is on the way to, now Mort went through this. These are my managers for the uh, uh, post-recovery. This is the, it's, it's a very large team that goes out to the splashdown area the same way Mort did. And you go to the splashdown area and, and keep that there for a while. And, uh, and uh, what we do uh, is safe the vehicle because it's not safe when it comes back. It is just not safe. You have all kinds of... Uh, of, of hazardous materials, unsymmetrical dimethyl hydrazine, I'm not showing at all. That's just, <laughs> just one of them. And uh, nitrogen tetroxide for your chemistry, chemistry people, I think that's N2SO4, and, uh, and, and other uh, materials. And there are some pyrotechnics on there also. So all that has to be safe. And if it, if it was a lunar mission uh, where they brought back rocks, then we had to uh, clean it with the uh, 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 formaldehyde, a pyro, uh, uh, something, something, formaldehyde, very strong stuff to make sure that we weren't going to contaminate everybody with what came from the surface of the moon. Uh, after about three flights, we stopped that because we decided that there was no contamination. If there was anything, we'd be contaminating the moon. So, uh, 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 this is, this is from my chart here. Uh, uh, I know you see a lot of managers. There was a thing called manager on manager at that time because the behavioral scientists, I got nothing against behavioral scientists, the behavioral scientists felt that we need a better way of relating to each other instead of showing different levels of management. That show that. So we had manager on manager, so you can see I'm the manager, my assistant manager is called the manager, all of these are, ma are, are managers, bring it up, these are my senior test project engineering managers, and then the level below them 
these are all managers. So that's why I call myself the senior. Later they changed that. Uh, this group, this group here, here is the systems engineering group. Man, these guys were sharp. But uh, NASA, I, I would never have thought that I would be considered one of the best engineers in the world. I know I was because NASA only hired the best. And they could afford that because everybody and his brother wanted to be on that program. And they didn't have to wait. They had long lines, and they just took the, the very best. These were the best systems engineers. These people knew their... Is the systems engineer from uh, Downey here? It's not here? Okay. These are these, the systems engineers. Uh, go back up just a point of corner to show this one. This, this is my systems engineer right in the middle of the program. He's building, Hutch is building his own airplane. You see, sometimes we take these things far. Some of us build our missiles and mm -hmm. want to get into a hut was building his own airplane. And he took it for a test drive and didn't make it back. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, that was that was quite a loss when I lost when I lost Hutch. He was one of the best in the world. Uh, but people say that the engineers, men don't talk to each other. Men don't talk well. We don't need to talk the way women talk. And and uh, but we do talk. We do communicate. They're saying you don't communicate. Yes, we do communicate. Uh, I'm not going to show you which one it was, but I see one name up there. The Vietnam, uh, the Vietnam War, was just a blur to me. I was too busy with Apollo, and uh, people were getting killed, and I didn't think anything of it. And uh, as time went by, one man on that chart, I'm not going to call his name. He comes to my secretary, and my secretary says, he's out there. And she says, he doesn't look good. I said, let him come in. He comes in, and he sits down. He doesn't say a word. Okay, I knew he was trouble. I'm not going to go force myself and ask him, to, you know, I know you ladies, you're going to go, well, what is, we don't do that. We don't, and it's all right. That's the way, that's the way we, we're guys. Mm -hmm. You have to understand that we're guys. We do things differently. So he sits there, and, uh, and, and I didn't say anything. He must have sat there for about three or four minutes. And I said, uh, tough, huh? He says, yeah, yeah. I said, well, sometimes those things happen. And uh, so after a couple of minutes, he goes, yeah, really tough. I said, well, as long as you know that all of us are here, if there's anything that we can do, that we're here. And I said, does it? Well, take, take your time. He said, well, I don't want to don't worry about that. I said, you're important to me. So he sits there, and then pretty soon the tears, the tears start coming out of his eyes. And I just waited for him. And he said, it happened. I said, what? My son just got killed in the Vietnam War. That brought the Vietnam War close to me. All of a sudden, I'm, I'm aware that there's a war going on, that there's more going on than just Apollo, but that there's a, there's a war going on. And he sat there, and uh, we didn't say much. Uh, every now and then, then he'd say something, and I'd say something. And Roscoe got up, came to me, shook my hand. He says, I sure thank you, Norm. This was very, I said, I understand that. It's OK. I shook his hand, had him on the shoulder, and he walked out. Men do communicate. We just do it differently. Excuse me for that. OK, babies? <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, uh, this, this, uh, go, can you move it over this way a little bit? Okay, stop right here. These are the people who wrote the procedures. Not only did we, did we, did we do the troubleshooting and build the system, here are the people, the, the engineers who wrote the procedures, the tech manuals, and I'm pleased to say that I uh, 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 authored quite a few of those. But these are the tech, technical manuals. All of these people, all, all of this system uh, was under, no, it, this doesn't show all of it. Uh, uh, there were other systems as well that was, that was under this organization. Would you move it over to this way, please? Here we call, here's the ones we call the brain surgeons. I don't know how they understood that guidance system. Uh, I'm sure we got some guidance engineers or people who are studying guidance. Uh, 
uh, the debt guidance system is really something. It, it, uh, it tells you where you are by telling you where you're not. That's just what it does. And this is a system that can hit a predetermined target from 6,000 miles away. And uh, with the Titan II, that Titan II was even, the, even more, more accurate. Uh, uh, so now we're on Apollo. Uh, I had to reorganize it. Uh, I don't want to bore you and tell you how things were done on Apollo and get into the details of it, but and how much time? Have I gone over the I guess I have. I guess I've been to here for quite some time. So I'm gonna let you go soon. But I did want to say say this to you. The Apollo program uh, was was the most unusual, uh, probably the most rewarding program. I've ever been on. There are some exceptions. Uh, when I was uh, uh, an independent uh, consultant, uh, I did go and work, do some work for churches. Uh, I, I didn't charge. I didn't charge. And uh, I went to work for the American Baptist Churches of uh, Los Angeles. And did, some, did some work, for, became the business manager. And also for the First Baptist Church of Woodland Hills, when it had its uh, earthquake. Remember that devastating earthquake, at the, the Northridge earthquake? Uh, it really rocked that place. And uh, uh, they had a pre-meeting after the... Well, one thing is, the day of the earthquake, Island and I, our house was in such a mess, we decided we had to get out of it. And uh, we went to the church. And uh, Island showed me that the... Uh, that great big heavy stone uh, was in the middle of the floor, and it had stressed the gas line. I did not know that uh, uh, Richard McWhorter had come there earlier and had uh, turned that gas line off, and I thought that was dangerous. Don't ask me how I did that, and Ivan doesn't know either. I just put my arms into that and moved that stone alone all, all the way back to where it was supposed to be. To this day, I don't know where, well, you know, you get that strength, I guess, uh, but I did that, and uh, the, 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 the floor of the, of the uh, we get excited when we hear noise. <laughs> <laughs> but the floor of the, the uh, office was just full of, of everything. It, it was just filled, and I tried to clean some of that up, and that was really my first association with the church. I was a member of that church. I was not. I was too busy with Apollo as far as I was concerned to be a member of anything. And uh, uh, they had a meeting, and that night uh, someone said they might come and red tag our, 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 our uh, buildings. And somebody said, oh, no, 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 I've had some, some training. I know they're not going to red tag it. I thought you're in trouble. And uh, sure enough, uh, uh, the next day there were red tags everywhere. Even a recommendation that with one area be torn down. Uh, I didn't work too well with the with the uh, church family because I didn't understand something. And Sam here, I thank you, Sam, for helping me to understand that. I didn't understand. See, in engineering, you you, you don't respond to a slap on the back or job well done. You 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 respond to a paycheck and a promotion. That's what you respond to. And I wasn't. I didn't understand that in church it's different. You know, you respond to somebody says something nice about you. And uh, so Sam says, it tells me, to, you know, if the pastor, is, when he brings up all the good things that's happened, uh, have him mention their name and sl slap off a little bit on your name. So I did that and then started working a little better with them. But uh, 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 still, I did not tell any of any, anyone my background. I worked for the for the church. I only told one person, that's Dr. Chetty, and I had to tell him because I felt that he knew something anyhow because he made me the business manager of that great big organization. So I felt okay. Sam and Walt and uh, Walter Clark, they're going to they're going to know something. They knew something. So uh, I did one night. Sam took me to dinner, and I said, Sam, I got something to tell you. And at that time, I opened that book and I told Sam, and he knew that I didn't want anybody to help. So I'm at the, at the, at the First Baptist Church of Woodland Hill. I've been awful 
awful problem. Please stay with me to this one. Awful problem with the, with, with the, I just thought they just don't like me. And, and no matter, seems that no matter what I did, they weren't satisfied. Uh, and it wasn't the, the, the church top leadership, it was the people that were helping me. So uh, fortunately, I, there, there were some two engineers, there was George, George Williams here? Oh, Jan, okay. Then George Williams is a fine electrical engineer, and he helped me made up some drawings so that I could know where we could hook up things. And uh, and and Tom Miller, so I had an engineer, a, a electrical engineer, a mechanical engineer, and uh, and the, the rest of it just seemed like I all of all had to fight the whole time. Well, one one night, I day after church, instead of going to the fellowship hall. I went out to those trees. There's two trees out there, and I used to go up there and stand. And I decided, I've had it. I'm not going to take this anymore. I, I just can't continue to work. I'm just not cut out for this. Not cut out for this. And uh, so I walked around the church, into the around the fellowship hall, into the church. And hey, we just had a great big monstrous earthquake, okay? Now that was dangerous for me to do that. I'm, so I walked right down into the center of the church. And, and I stood there and I said, uh, I'm not going to quit. This is not, I'm not going to put up with this anymore. At that time, a 5.2 aftershock hit. Uh, that's pretty, you know, you know that we have, we have regular earthquakes in five in the five area. So this 5.2 earthquakes hit and, and Ida was in the office. I saw her moving moving out, and I thought, I can't make it. I'm not going to be able to make it that far. I'm in the center of the church, and I thought, okay, this is it. And uh, uh, so, uh, and I'm all right over one of the beams, and I thought, and I'm near the back, and I thought, I'm not going to make it out of this church, and I might as well, be, okay, this, this, this is going to be the end of Norman. And I thought, well, maybe I can make it to that back door. And, I, and then I thought, you know, Maybe somebody doesn't want me to quit this job. <laughs> I started to think. I said, something, something what, what is this? And the and all the, the earthquake stopped. The, the, everything was rolling, it stopped. Well, I wasn't going to take a chance. You see, there's sometimes when you learn to pray, and sometimes when you just think you have to. Sam, I want you to know that I, I learned how to pray real, really quick. And uh, so I decided, okay, I better stick this one out. I, I, I don't want to take the chance. So uh, I did, and uh, and some of the volunteers became my my secretary. I got one of them here, Lou Williams, Coach Andrew, and uh, 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 talk about a person who would keep you straight. I went walking one day, and I usually took a walk for for uh, uh, lunch, and uh, I, I I decided I'd go further that day. And I got back. I was going a long time, and this lady here was beside herself. And climbing all over me, I told you, a, 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 a drill sergeant couldn't have done it better because I had gone that far, and I've got all this stuff in my head. She's saying, and if you and nobody know what to do, then Lou really got on me that day, and I want you to know Lou that I appreciate it. There's some more. Oh, I've got. To, what is this about? Do you want to know something? That's I. <laughs> <laughs> That's her. That is Ida with the Ronald Reagan, and this man, go back please, the man up there is, is the, the Secret Service, and I'm over on this side, and uh, this and this is Henry Kissinger, Henry Kissinger and I are sharing something that we were laughing about, and uh, 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 I'll tell you why this happened soon, and uh, there's some more pictures, this is with Henry Kissinger, this is with Senator Dole, and uh, Senator Bob Dole, of the prominent uh, at that time, oh. this is with Bob Hope, and uh, 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 for the, uh, the the concerts that night, we sat only ten boxes away from the president, and uh, and I really got upset that night because they sent the Secret Service over. You know, I was the only dark spot in that area at that time, so they sent the Secret Service over to check me out, and uh, I don't know why I got so here. I was really really irritated. And everybody was coming and said, no, so, uh, so uh, this is this is Attorney General Klein. Well, you know, they fired the other ones. So 
this is attorney for the client X, and uh, this is uh, me with the, with the, with the, with the spacecraft. This was spacecraft two. This was uh, some of the news. Uh, uh, people wanted to know how did I, how did, how did this happen? Uh, stop. I knew the astronauts. I can't say that I knew each astronaut personally, but I can tell you this. The manager that the astronauts knew worked for me. Uh, there, there, there was not another unit closer to the Apollo spacecraft system than my group. There are no ifs or ands or qualifications of any kind to that. There was not another, any, no unit in NASA, any subcontract was any closer to the unit of which I was responsible. And uh, uh, it, 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 was, it was an awful lot of pressure. And I'll get into some more of that later. We killed three astronauts. No, you know, you say to yourself, the tree of research and development must be periodically nourished by blood. And that's true. That's true. The point that I made is, but not on the ground. Not on the ground. And uh, I took that very hard. So when I walked off uh, away from Apollo, uh, I felt that that would be the last time I would go back to Apollo. I didn't want to hear any more any more anything, I didn't want to hear the word Apollo, because I felt that uh, uh, that there needed to be more of an investigation as to why that happened. Uh, 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 we engineers knew what the problem was. One problem was uh, that uh, there was no fast actuating door. I mean, if they had the fast act actuating door, all they'd have to do is press a button, and out they are. Well, uh, 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 the fast actuating door would have uh, held the program up for four, maybe four or five more months. And I thought that was a wise thing to do. As it was, it held it up for about 17 more months. Because they, so uh, they didn't do that. Now NASA has talked to me. They've talked to all of us who were close to spacecraft. They've sent us to psychiatrists and everybody else. And then none of that worked for me uh, because while all the other people say, well, normally it wasn't just, your, just you, and so I know that, that the, the, the spacecraft didn't catch on fire here, it caught on fire at the Cape. But I had to look to see, I mean, figure it out, that my group was the closest one to the spacecraft. So did I overlook something? Is there something that I could have done so that uh, that, that fire could not have happened? And I checked that thoroughly and I couldn't find anything. Uh, uh, and I thought about that. NASA has talked about their responsibility and Rockwell and everybody has fessed up and said, yeah, we all take responsibility for that. But it happens. My point is, we don't kill people on the launch site. If it, if it happens up in the air, that's just the way it goes. Uh, but sitting on the launch site, something went, something goes wrong. When you read all of that, you know exactly what was going wrong. They should not have continued with that launch. They were having all kinds of communication problems. And and they, they made a substitution. Uh, our procedure called for pure air to be used for the ground test, and they were using oxygen. <laughs> well, that was one of the problems. So, so and, and, and Gus, at that particular time, was, was doing something with the communication system which could have caused a spark. Well, you know, it's, it's, that's what happened. These men were not just astronauts to me, they were my friends. I knew them. I worked with them. I didn't know this kid very much because he was a rookie. Uh, uh, Walter uh, 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 Shappy. He was a rookie and I didn't know him that well, but I mean I knew him. Uh, but I, but these, these men we laughed and joked and talked with, uh, about. So uh, 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 it, it isn't easy hearing your friend screaming. It, it, it just isn't an easy thing to take. So, uh, uh, so when they say to me, "You, it, it wasn't you. There, there are other people. You have to consider that there were so many involved." And I say, "Yeah, but there's one thing that I did that nobody else did. On a given morning, I had my secretary call Gus Grissom, and he came up, and I had an envelope. I said, "Gus, you're going to need this." He opened it up. He says, you, uh, you're right. Norm put his arm around me. He said, I'll see you. I had just given him the keys to Apollo 1. Well, 
So I had to consider, did I do everything that I could? Did I? And I thought, yes, I did. Yes, I did. I did everything that I could, but I didn't. I didn't. When the top NASA people came in, and all of them, anyone who would listen, I would tell them, we engineers don't like the fact that you got this, this hatch that's sealed. We, we don't do things that way. For all the airplanes, we've always got an escape route. You don't have an escape route. And so the NASA people said yes, but on the other hand, we don't think it's a big problem because if it, happened, if, if it happens up there, where are they going to go? Where are they going to go? And that's a good point. But what about the launch pads? Eh? So uh, 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 I talked to all of them about that, and that's the story that they gave me. And I accepted that, and I should not have. And that's why I stayed away from Apollo. Because if I had, if I was as brave as I thought that I was, I probably would have said something to the press either. Well, maybe they wouldn't have listened. See, my position was not as high at that time. I was not in charge of the whole world. I only had one check of the checkout stations at that time. So I, 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 I doubt that they would have really listened to me even if I said something to the press. They said, well, he's just a manager. Or something happened later. You see, I learned from my mistakes. I only make a mistake once. I'm not going to make it twice. For the middle block, two vehicles came out with the actuating hatch. All you had to do was press a button and that door would open faster than you could blink your eyes. That's what they needed and 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 that's what we put for Apollo 7. I thank all of you for, uh, there are other things that I could say. Uh, uh, I, I tried not to be too technical. Uh, I've got a whole thing of technical things that I could say here, but uh, I didn't think that you really wanted that. Norman Howard Kessel continues to provide technical management consulting to large organizations to this very day and is as charming as ever. The San Diego Air and Space Museum continues to develop Mr. Kessel's private collection and online exhibit. If you know Mr. Kessel or have stories to share, please contact Katrina Pescador at the email listed here or yours truly, Steve Hicks, who is in contact with Mr. Kessel. San Diego has one of the richest aviation heritages of any city in the world. Convair, home of such famous aircraft as the B-24 Liberator and the PBY Catalina, was founded here. Ryan Aeronautical, home of Lindbergh's Spirit of St. Louis, was located here. And North Island Naval Air Station is the birthplace of naval aviation. The San Diego Air and Space Museum is a major institution unique to the region and one of the preeminent aviation museums in the nation. In 1986, the museum became the first aero-themed museum to be accredited by the American Association of Museums, and it is now a Smithsonian affiliate. The California legislature voted to declare the museum California's official Air and Space Museum and Education Center. 
Because of San Diego's contributions to aviation and aerospace history and technology, it is only fitting that the museum is now recognized as one of the country's premier aerospace museums. This video was produced through the collaborative efforts of Katrina Pescador, San Diego Air and Space Museum Library and Archives Director, and Steve Hicks, San Diego Air and Space Museum volunteer and personal friend of Norman Howard Kessel. Under Katrina Pescador's leadership since 2005, the Library and Archives has expanded well beyond its walls through a dramatic online presence. The card catalog was placed into an online library system, and then both Flickr and YouTube sites were launched to provide and highlight digitized images and films. To date, over 305,000 images and films have been placed online, receiving over 40 million views each year. We believe this is the largest online collection of its type in the world. In 2013, the video was filmed by Katrina Pescador's team on site at the museum. In 2014, the museum was named one of the top eight museums in the world to use social media to spotlight its collection and was the only one of the eight dedicated to air and space history. Much of this growth has been made possible through Katrina Pescador's efforts with almost 40 volunteers who contributed over 7,000 hours in 2014 alone. Steve Hicks is a lifelong San Diego resident, UCSD cognitive science alum, aerospace enthusiast, and personal friend of Mr. Norman Howard Kessel. In 2009, Steve had the extraordinary and serendipitous honor of introducing Mr. Kessel to the San Diego Air and Space Museum. Steve has since assisted him in revisiting Apollo sites, as well as capturing many of his oral histories. This led to the presentation at the museum, attended by scores of people from Mr. Kesson's life.